Yeah. Okay. If you have your Bibles, go to the book of Luke, chapter 4. What season, from a Christian calendar perspective, are we in? The season of? Lent. It starts today. We, we uh, celebrated Ash Wednesday. That's pretty much Western church sort of celebrates the, the Ash Wednesday side. And we did that this uh, week, uh, Wednesday from 12 to 1. And what's just so precious about it, our, our Royal Rangers do the ashes uh, from the previous year's Palm Sunday. And um, we found a new ash maker, Rob. Amanda did a phenomenal job taking those ashes that the little boys burnt and made uh, ashes. So that was that was a cool thing. But Lent is Lent, Lent is, is a is a the Lenten season is a season that for those that that it's new to, um, it's a season to pull away. Everybody say pull away. Uh, and in doing so, in pulling away, we, we, we take some time for, for prayer, reflection. Fasting typically is involved with it as well. And then a word that we don't use a whole lot in, in our modern vernacular, but almsgiving, that simply looking out for those that are less advantaged and being able to give towards that. And so those, those things accompany Lent. And the, the question is, what for? Right? Why, why did the church adopt very early on a season of Lent? And uh, obviously something doesn't continue that long if it's no longer effective. Right? It, it, it's, a, it's a discipline that when entered into it has great payoffs. But this Lenten season, I'm going to take us on a journey in moving with God. So we're, di- we're going to be moving through some different things. And, and we're starting out today uh, today we're going to move into the desert and we're going to we're going to navigate our way to the cross we'll end up there about in about 6 weeks right so we're going to look at several different things we're going to dig deeply into the life of Christ with with certain key moments in the life of Christ and see how those things can speak to us during this season of lent if lent's new to you i encourage you to maybe go on our website and look at find um the table right is that what's it called a podcast called the table and uh, we, we talked about this last year, but Rob and I did a table, uh, a new one this year that was, was uh, broadcast before Ash Wednesday. So from here on out, we will, Rob and I at the very least, maybe Pastor Andy as well, we'll be doing a table podcast uh, that will talk about this message today. We're going to talk about it more in depth uh, when we do our table podcast this week. And so I encourage you to maybe um, uh, tune into it and, and get aboard. Well, let me ask you a question. How many of you have moved before? Go ahead and raise your hand. So uh, now put your hands down. Let me do, there was one person in our first service. She was 16 years old. I said, who in here has never moved before? And a 16-year-old girl raised her hand. And I'm like, okay, that's fair. If you're an adult... In your college age years, are any of you still living at home where you were born? I guess nobody may want to admit that. I'm 42 and I still live with my mom. Um, That can be a good thing. But we've all moved. The point is that we've all moved, right? Now let me ask, how many of you would like to move again? Raise your hands. Never. Never. Oh, man. No, 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 no. Moving is a curse. No, it's not. Moving brings with it opportunity, right? You get to go to a different place of geography. You get to find out new country, Um, possibly a job's associated with it, or maybe retirement might be associated with it. It's the opportunity to meet new friends, right? To just kind of get around, hang around some people who don't drive you nuts. (laughs) My point is, is it brings opportunity, but it also brings a little bit of fear of the unknown. (coughs) How's it all going to work out? Am I going to 
Am I going to like my new area? Am I going to like my new job? Man, I hope I meet some friends quickly, you know, and so on and so forth. So we're going to go on this move throughout Lent, and hopefully we can, we can maybe be, be sensitized to allow the Spirit of God to do some things in us. And the first move that we're going to look at is we're going to go into the desert. And in Luke chapter 4, uh, is is well where we will start. Uh, and in doing so, let me just say that a move reveals a few things about people, right? And you're, you're probably, you know, first big move might have been out of high school. Maybe you went somewhere to college and you moved or, you know, whatever. But if you've moved anywhere, maybe across country, different job, the whole nine years, it can reveal some things about you that you maybe didn't know was there. That maybe your spouse needed to get better driving lessons. <laughs> I don't know. Can I correct part of Durette's story? <laughs> I know I'm treading on thin air, but you can't say anything. She makes it sound really altruistic that, you know, I, I realized that I was doing to my husband what I don't like him doing to me. Let me tell you how that point of realization came about. <laughs> because she makes it sound like she was going along and the Spirit of the Lord just tapped her on the shoulder <laughs> and said whatever. Mm -mm. No, God was not involved. It might have been me saying something about, you know, who's driving? I'm 63 years old. I do not need your help. Thank you. <laughs> then I realized, I just realized that the, you know, I, so anyhow, that's just a, a minor point of clarification. <clears throat> and I haven't agreed to whatever pact she said we agreed to. So I'll let her go down that pact for a while and see how good it works. Yeah, and, and, and you can allow the Holy Spirit to work on me to do whatever. Okay, so moves when you spend a lot of t time in a truck or whatever. When Dret and I moved here in 1988, uh, we did we leave like on April 30th? First of May. Our first service was May 15th. So we pack up in a truck. At that time, we had a three-year-old daughter and a one-year-old daughter, and that was it. And we packed up in a truck. And uh, what is it with these moving companies that put a governor on a truck? Some of you going, what's a governor? It's a curse from hell. <laughs> a, a governor is a little thing on a motor that doesn't let it go more than 50 miles an hour going downhill. Going uphill, yeah, it allows you to go about 20. Anyhow, it'll cause, it'll, it'll, it'll reveal some things about you or your spouse that you didn't realize, right? Dret probably saw on that trip how much, how much I talked to other vehicles, <laughs> right? It's like, it helps. If it really doesn't help, it helps me, <laughs> right? So, so anyhow, you, five days later, we end up here, and, and it just reveals a lot of things about ourselves. And, and I just want to encourage you right off the bat, expect to have some things revealed to you during this season of Lent. Expect the Lord to move upon your heart, to chat with you about some things, maybe not in a voice, but to expect to come across some things that can really bring transformation. I know some, I know people will say, well, I don't need a special season of that. It's like, you, you're right if you do everything else right. But the truth is, is that we need to take time away and pull ourselves away. And that's what the season of Lent is. It's a time to step back from the normal rat race of life and all of its noise and all of its whatever. And it's, it's a time to pull away and simply just begin to take internal inventory and see how things are going, right? Um, this happens in all areas of life, right? Any organization that's worth their weight at all 
will have times of internal reflection. And it's important that we do that. Here it says uh, in Luke chapter 4, let's start reading in verse 1. We'll go through the first 13 verses. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So we're just going to kind of take this sort of verse by verse and where we can maybe just bring out some points. So in going to the, in going uh, in going into the desert, I think there's incredible things that we can learn about ourselves. First of all, one has to ask the question. So we don't like to talk about this in the body of Christ because we don't like desert experiences. Are you with me? We, we typically don't like it. We would like to avoid it at all cost, right? And we kind of have a, a nuanced way of thinking that in serving God, it, that, that there, there shouldn't be any times that we might refer to as desert sort of times, right? We, we tend to think the idea that, no, it's not like that. We just, victory in Jesus, you know, all, we, we, we want to we wanna just look at all the, the wonderful things that are true in Scripture of who we are. We're the head, and not the tail, so on and so forth. But the truth is, let me just ask a question. Don't raise your hand. But how many of you have had some sort of desert type experience? I would say every one of us in here. That there's been times in our life that we're not just quite as perky as normal. And that maybe there's a time in life that things are kind of, I don't know. Just different. My brother and I, uh, in our younger years, uh, especially during fellow full gospel businessmen, how many of you remember that group? Years ago, during the kind of the charismatic move that, that swept across America in the late 60s and into the 70s and sort of then started waning a bit in the 80s. But my brother and I used to <clears throat> travel and sing together and... I'll just never forget, I, I went through a time in my Christian walk um, that lasted about six months for me. That was, that was just drier than dry. It seemed like every time I prayed, my, my prayers went up to heaven, turned around, bounced off the top of my head again, right? Felt like there was nothing. I didn't feel saved, right? Right? And I know some of you are going, yeah, well, that's, there's your problem. You shouldn't go off your feelings anyhow. Okay, but I'm just telling you, my feelings would have painted a picture for me that was bleak. I just, I just remember talking to my brother and just crying and go, Larry, I, don't, I just don't feel anything. I, I, I just almost feel numb. And if you ever been there, you don't have to raise your hands. But I just feel like, ah. So he would, bless his heart, he was really a sweet big brother most of the time. He would just sit down and then we would just, you know, after we did a concert, we traveled all over the Midwest. After we did a concert somewhere and we're driving back, the conversation would just go, you know, man. I, I, I remember telling him, I said, I just feel like such a fake. And he goes, what do you mean? And it's like we, we sang about all these songs about the Lord and all of this stuff. And I said, I'm just in a spot. I said, I'm just, I'm just dry. There's just nothing. So then we would talk through and we'd just go through kind of a checklist. You know, pilots, pilots get used to checklists. And part of our checklist would be, so, so do you love the Lord? I absolutely love the Lord. I want to follow him all the days of my life. I know I'm called into the ministry. Okay, and so is there any known sin between you and God? It's like, I'm certainly not perfect, but no, I'm. He said, well, then what you have to just do is you have to believe what the word says. And you've called out on the name of the Lord and you're saved. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. So I would say those words and I'd say them through my tears, but there was nothing that backed it up. Nothing that backed it up. And that, you know, I just remember that time in my life that I just thought, wow, 
So when I reflect back on that time in my life, here's what I also know, is that I had so much time that I'd have never had before to really do some inventory issues on my life. And it says here that Jesus was led by the Spirit. Everybody say, led by the Spirit. That's really important. Um, So what that tells me is that a desert experience isn't necessarily at all of the devil. Are you with me? So if that's the case, then what does that mean? So what, what happens in a desert? A lot of things happen in a desert. Probably the first thing that happens in a desert, if you're taking notes, is, is it's quiet. Right? If you're in a desert, how many of you know you're not in the middle of L.A.? Well, you could be, I guess, but analogies aside. Being in a desert is a place to get quiet. You're, there's very little competition going on. Few people like to go to the desert and camp there for any amount of time, right? So in the desert, there's a place of quietness. And so it says that Jesus went there for 40 days where he was tempted of the devil. Where does 40 come from? Where is the first 40 in the Bible that we have reference to? Old Testament, what? The flood, right? Rain for how long? 40 days or 40 nights. Then when's the next time that 40 is used? Chronologically, at least. Children of Israel, right? When they went into the desert, they were there for how long? 40 years. Um, 40 is just that number that, you know, there's precedence in Scripture for it. And Jesus went into the desert for 40 days where he is tempted of the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days. And when they were over, he was famished. Only stands the reason, right? Then the devil said in this first temptation, it says, if you're the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. And Jesus answered him and said, it's written. One doesn't live by bread alone. So we know the gist of the story. If you've been in the body of Christ for any amount of time, that when Jesus was tempted, he responded back with something greater than his feelings. And that greater than his feelings is the word of God. What does the word say? So so there's several things about this. In the desert, you get your identity. Your identity comes into question. That's really important. Your identity needs to come into question so that you can know that you know that you know who you are. That's really important. Unless we know who we really are, The truth is, is we could just get hoodwinked. The enemy could tell us that we're something or someone that we're really not. It says there that his identity was questioned at the beginning. If you're the son of God. So do you think that maybe made Jesus question just a little bit? That's a trick question. I know many of you are going, well, no. Yeah. Okay, let me just be careful. If you... If you have the idea, oh, that was no big deal for Jesus, then you've got a real, a real problem because then the Savior that we serve really wasn't tempted in all ways like we are. So the correct answer to that is, do you think he questioned his identity? I'm going to say yes. He answered it. Here was a temporary truth. The temporary truth was is that he was hungry. He was famished. So this is the easiest of the temptations from a complexity perspective. Pretty simple. <clears throat> he fasted for 40 days, didn't eat anything. Here he is. He's, he's hungry. He's famished. The enemy comes to him with tempting him with food. Hey, wouldn't a loaf of bread will solve what you're feeling. And Jesus then points to a greater truth. And, and, and this is what happens to us when we take the time to get away and to get quiet and to shut off the rat race of life, turn the decibel down to living, whatever you want to say to help, to, to, to pull away and get introspective, pull away to sacrifice yourself. Because here's the thing. 
Voluntary sacrifice is always better than involuntary sacrifice. Never forget that. In other words, Dret mentioned about hope deferred, and she used the idea that if, if we defer good things or things that we should be doing, if we do defer it, then it could come to a point that it becomes catastrophic, right? In other words, what I mean by voluntary sacrifice, I mean, um, I was really never one of these guys, but you'll, you'll get the gist. If you can't defer eating Twinkies and washing it down with Dr. Pepper as your main source of nutrition, if you can't defer that, i.e. Voluntary, voluntarily sacrificing eating Twinkies and Dr. Pepper, if we can't voluntarily do that, how many of you know there may be a medical incidence that then we're required? Now, voluntary is no longer an issue. Now it's involuntary, right? If, and from a, from a law enforcement perspective, if I can't defer wanting to steal that urge to take other people's stuff, if I can't defer that and I continue taking other people's stuff, then I may be forced in an involuntary sacrifice by sitting in a jail cell somewhere. And now I'm on purpose having to sacrifice stealing. So, so you get what I mean by involuntary versus voluntary sacrifice. The devil said to him, if you're the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus said, it's written, one doesn't live by bread alone. Okay, then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of this world. Let me just tell you, the devil can do supernatural things. The only reason I say that is many times people will come to me and tell me about a, quote, supernatural experience, and because it was supernatural, it had to be God right. And my answer always is, no, it didn't have to be God. Just because it's supernatural doesn't make it God. Here, Jesus was shown in an instant. It was miraculous. It was supernatural. It says that he showed him the, the kingdoms, uh, da, 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 the kingdoms of the world. The devil said to him, to you, I will give their glory and all this authority for it has been given over to me. True or false? True. Satan became the God of this world when? In the fall, Satan has authority in this world. How many of you know God has the trump card? Ooh, I hate using that word. <laughs> How many of you know God has the final say? Okay. One doesn't live by bread alone. The devil let him, showed him in an instant all the kings of the world. And the devil said to him, to you, I'll give their glory and all this authority for it's been given over to me and I give it to anyone I please. <clears throat> if you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him and said, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. So this temptation ratcheted things up. Just a little bit. Are you with me? Because it started off with something supernatural. Showed him all the kingdoms of this world. So what that looked like to Jesus, I don't know. But it happened. Are you with me? Jesus responding, responded back. So, so far in this, some things that we can learn in the desert is we can learn about our identity. And as we spend time with the word, in the word, we're then able to combat things going forward in a way that sets us up for victory. Jesus said, it is written. Okay, so here's the second temptation. So the first one is, is you know, so sins get broken down into three categories, right? You can find those in the epistles. First one, Jesus simply was, he's hungry. Wouldn't you love to have a loaf of bread? Uh, just turn these stones into bread. Where was that a reference to, by the way? 
Old Testament, maybe manna from heaven. How many of you know Moses stuck, struck a rock and water flowed, right? Now, Jesus is tempted with influence, with authority. Interesting that, how many of you know the devil knew who Jesus was? This is an interesting one for me, but we won't spend a whole lot of time there. The next one ramps it up even further. So here, the, the uh, sorry. Jesus said, it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So always, guys, we'll have alternate realities, right? We'll have alternate realities before us. And experience is reality in one sense, but because an experience is reality does not make it the truth. There's a difference. Are you with me? I mean, if you know the enemy could sit on your shoulder and convince you that you're an absolute, you have no value. Your life has no value, no worth at all, right? And your experience and the feeling of that. To deny that experience and say it's not real is really unkind. Because there's a person that really is feeling something. So it's there and it's a reality. But how many of you know it's not the truth? For the Christian, the truth is, what does God say? So this is what life is. All I mean, you know, if you wanted to simplify things, it's a series of being presented with different realities, and then we choose which reality we're going to believe. One reality says you're worth nothing, and you feel like it, all the associated feelings that go with it. You sense that, you feel it, you're whatever. The kicker is, is when we feel that reality and then make a determination, well, then that must be what's true. That's when we're in trouble. What's true about the Word of God? What does the Word of God say? That you were fearfully and that you were wonderfully made. How many of you know you're not an accident? I mean, we could go into a whole bunch of scripture that talks about who you are as a son or a daughter of God. You're not, you're not just an, a cosmic accident in life. And so the truth says that the God of the universe thinks about you. And when he thinks about you, he thinks about you with a wonderful future in mind and all sorts of stuff. But then you've got this other alternate reality that says, I feel like junk. I'm not worth anything. Then we just have to choose. Which one are we going to believe? Are we going to believe the truth? Or are we going to believe this alternate reality? And so Jesus, obviously, for our example, <coughs> always... Went with the truth. I encourage us. We need to go with the truth. The devil took him then to Jerusalem, placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, now this ranch ratchets up. If you're the son of God, how many of you know your identity will always come into question? It's really important. Your identity as a believer will always come into question. And why is that? It's because we were born into sin. And because we were born into sin, let me just ask you a question. How many of you made some stupid mistakes before Jesus? Raise your hand. How many of you made some stupid mistakes after Jesus? Raise your hand. That's every one of us, right? So the enemy's got instantly, instantly, the enemy's got good ground to tempt us with, right? He'll tempt your identity. So in the desert, you can find out who you really are. And that can get solidified in you, in whom you really are. If you're the son of God, then throw yourself down from here. Uh-oh, now the devil introduces something that we need to be aware of. He knows the word and he can quote the word. Are you with me? He said, it's written. He'll command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Okay, now that just gets tricky. When the enemy starts quoting the word of God, how many of you know, if we don't know the word of God, listen real close, in context. If we don't know the word of God in context, we might just buy stolen goods. Amen? So here the enemy came to Jesus at the first one with just something deal. It's like, okay, hungry. Famish right before him. Wouldn't, wouldn't you love to have something to eat right now? Okay, Jesus puts that down. The next one starts it off with a supernatural occurrence. Ooh, okay. Now Jesus 
interpreted that correctly as well. And then this third one, now he quotes the word of God. Interesting. Because here's what I find. Every pastor in any denomination in any country of the world has heard this story before. Well, you know, pastor, I'm coming to you to get your thoughts on this. And they'll tell of a supernatural dream or a supernatural occurrence. And then many times, and the word even says, and they'll say, so that has to be God, right? And my response is, no, that doesn't need to be God at all. It could be, but it may not be. And listen, I know. Well, couldn't it just be easier than that? I wish it was. Right? I wish it was easier than that. I wish there was a secret thing that we could look at, a super code that we could look at and go, okay, no, that's it. But you know what? The enemy can perform something supernatural. The enemy can speak, make it sound like God. The enemy can take the word of God and twist the word of God to where if we don't know the word of God, if, we're, if we don't have that heart within us that says, Lord, I, I, I really want to, I just don't want to bumble through life. I want to get through life knowing who I am, who you created me to be so that I can end up where you want me to go and look like what you want me to look like. So Jesus responded back <clears throat> because the enemy took the word of God out of context. Nobody does that today. <laughs> I tell the story years ago, it was on a Wednesday night. I can still, he sat right back there and I never, I never smoked. I, smoking was never a part of my life. I just, just didn't, I didn't smoke. So I think it's odd that it seems like God maybe sometimes has used me in to help people getting over a smoking addiction. It's just kind of funny because I don't know what that addiction is. I don't know what it's like to puff on an ash piece of charcoal. And um, so he comes up, and there were several people that came up for, to get set free from smoking, the addiction of smoking. And so I shared with them something that the Lord shared with me to share with people that I pray for for that. <laughs> I feel in many ways it's like if it works, it's totally God because I don't have a clue what they're going through. I don't have a clue what that addiction's about. So I don't have a whole lot of sympathy, right? I mean, I care, but anyhow. So he came forward. <clears throat> I prayed for a group of people. Within, within, within days, all of the people called me and said, Pastor, I've smoked for 23 years, and for the first time in my life, usually when I woke up, I guess it's a big deal. I can't imagine waking up and wanting to have a cigarette. But anyhow, my, my normal day for the last 20-something years of my life, I'd wake up, first thing I would get is, I, I guess that first puff of cigarette. I don't know. And, and it's like... I haven't had anything. I, I obeyed everything that you said, and you know what? It seems I can free. And, and it, with those people, months later, they were totally free. This one guy came up to me and uh, prayed for him. He came back the next Sunday, came up to me and said, Oh, Pastor, I just want you to know, I can, you know, appreciate you praying for smoking, but the Lord, but the Lord shared with me that it's okay for me to smoke. <laughs> and I said, Okay, cool. And I go, just kind of how did that come about? He said, well, the Lord took me back in Scripture. And in the Old Testament, it says a smoking reed he'll not quench. <laughs> scripture does say that. But the context is all wrong. <laughs> right? So he goes, so thank you. I'm going to keep smoking. So let me just ask a question. Did he take that out of context? Was it the word of God? Is it, is it possible? I'm not, I'm not going to say the devil told him, but just in, con, in part of our analogy, is it possible that the devil just told him, go ahead, keep smoking, destroy your lungs, get lung cancer and die. And it's okay because a smoking reed, the Lord will not quench. <laughs> and it came in the middle of the night. God woke him up two o'clock in the morning and spoke the word. It's got to be God, right? No, it doesn't have to be God. It could be 
a lie from the enemy. Are you with me? We could, we could take the scripture uh, that Judas went out, you know, and, and hung himself, right? That's scripture. I could tack another scripture on it and just say, go and do thou likewise. <laughs> right? And Judas went out and hung himself, so go and do thou likewise. I mean, you know, that wouldn't be God's word. I know that's a silly example, but the truth is, is that in the desert, we have an opportunity to to get some things maybe settled, certainly maybe to rediscover some things. Because how many of you know one of the things that the enemy does for the Christian is continually, it's a battering ram against who you really are. Amen? The enemy batters away at who we are in Jesus. And if he can get us to believe we're something else, if he can get us to believe that we're forever handicapped in this thing called the Christian life, if he can get us to believe some just flat-out lies, then how many of you know that our life maybe might not just meet everything that God created us to be? But I think if we can take some times where there's a voluntary sacrifice of pulling away, that's what Lent is. If we can take some time of pulling away, and if we can take that time and to say, okay, God, I'm going to look to you to discover who I am and and how I, because from there, from Jesus' time in the desert is when after that is when we would say that maybe from a more formal level, the ministry of Jesus became cataloged for us in the Gospels. It was in those three years of, of basically what we see of Jesus. And I think there's something significant about that it started in the desert. Do you? Or do you think it's just for a nice story? Ah, it's just a good story. It wasn't any big deal for Jesus. After all, he was the son of God. So what's a big deal? Ooh, don't believe that. Because when God sent Jesus into the world, the thing that I'm just most struck with is he didn't send Jesus to be a tourist in life. To drive by all the different various people groups and just kind of drive by in his limo and roll down his window and wave and go, oh, now I see what you're going through. No, when God sent Jesus to the earth, Jesus entered our world. If I could say it this way, he moved into a new neighborhood. He moved into a new people group and he lived among us and he walked it out, showing us the way. Amen. So with that, we'll continue on next week. Uh, Let's bow our head and close our eyes. If you're here this morning and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, man, I'd encourage you to do it. If you're here today and maybe you've drifted in your relationship with God, I'd encourage you to get back on track and renew that commitment to the Lord. For those that may be watching on screen, if that's you, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, we're going to do that here in a moment, and I encourage you to stick with us. But, Or if you've drifted in your relationship with God and just said, man, I just need to get on track, let's do it. This time of Lent, I would just say this, let's, let's do whatever we need to do to dig into God. Amen? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed here in this, this sanctuary, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life and you'd like to, or you would say, I just need to return, I need to recommit my life to Jesus uh, and get back on track, would you just acknowledge it by lifting your hand? Then we're all going to stand together and I'm going to lead us all in a prayer. I'm not going to call anyone out. I see that there, sir. Anyone else, by lifting your hand, you say, pray for me. I don't know Jesus, and I want to, or you would say, I just need to get back on track. Okay, could we all stand up? I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and I encourage you, if anybody's watching, pray this prayer with us. God will meet you right where you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's pray this together. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Jesus, I love you, and I want you to be the Lord of my life. Would you come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior? I want to follow you, Lord, all the days of my life. Would you help me do it by the power of your Holy Spirit? Thank you, Lord, for loving me, forgiving me, 
and accepting me into your family. In Jesus' name, amen.